the Seashore Foundation Center for Advanced Genocide Research, which is the academic uh, arm of the Shore Foundation. The center uh, develops an academic program which consists of uh, international conferences. We uh, have endowed fellowships uh, so that we bring scholars here to USC to work with the testimonies, and we have guest lectures. And we are happy to have uh, lectures like these uh, today. Um, uh, I want to introduce you uh, now to Stephen Smith, the executive uh, director of the USC Shaw Foundation. Well, good afternoon and welcome, and uh, it's a real pleasure to have you here at our uh, uh, Sarah and Asa Shapiro lecture and luncheon. And luncheon will be served uh, after our lecture today. Uh, my principal role here today uh, is to thank the patron of this event um, and its associated fellowship, Mickey Shapiro, uh, who's flown in from Michigan to be with us here today. And I want to thank you, Mickey, um, not only for being here today, but for all that you do for us as a member of the Board of Councillors of the USC Show Foundation throughout the year, uh, for your leadership and your guidance and your inspiration, um, for the many times that you come to USC and make this journey here, uh, but for the way in which you support us around the country and around the world. And uh, that's very much appreciated. And around the world, uh, folks, uh, also means in Michigan. <laughs> <laughs> now, I can say that I had never been to Ferris State University until this weekend, but I went there for a very special occasion. Because, if you look behind our photographer, <laughs> Uh, this weekend, Mickey Shapiro, who went from a Paris State University on probation 52 years ago with a 1.5 GPA, <laughs> returned to Paris State to receive a doctorate in industry and business as one of the leaders of industry and business in the state of Michigan. And it was a real privilege for me to be there because not only his leadership locally in that state but I knew from what he was sharing from that podium that his mission um, and the reason that we're here today is so bound up to his parents' story. A story that began in the Ukraine, in Western Ukraine, um, 75 years ago when uh, his parents, having survived the Holocaust, met and went to a DP camp where shortly afterwards Mickey was born in that DP camp. And so he comes here today not only um, to recognize his parents, who are not able to be with us here today, but do send greetings to all of us, um, to represent them and the whole Shapiro family, but to represent their story. And as we're going to hear, um, the fellow of the uh, USC Show Foundation this year, the Sarah and Asa Shapiro Fellow, and our lecturer today, uh, the, the content of our lecture is going to relate very closely um, to that very same region and that very same history, which is why it is such a pleasure uh, to welcome you here, Omer, and to have uh, the privilege of sharing with all of you today. So thank you so much for being here. Uh, it's almost impossible not to know Omer Bartok. He's one of the most uh, well, internationally well-known Holocaust scholars, and uh, but nevertheless, I will introduce him a little bit to you. So he is the John Birkeland, uh Distinguished Professor of European History, uh, and also a Professor of German Studies at Brown University. Before he came to Brown, he uh, taught at Rutgers University, and during all these years, he kind of accumulated uh, awards in a, a large scale. So I, I want to just name a few of them. He uh, was a center uh, fellow at uh, the Center for Advanced Study uh, for Behavioral Sciences in Stanford. He uh, had a Berlin Prize Fellowship at the American Academy in Berlin. He is a member of the American uh, Academy of Arts and Science since 2005. He had a Guggenheim Fellowship and he was at Princeton at the Radcliffe Institute. So you see his uh, scholarship is well received uh, and uh, uh, highly rewarded. His research is on uh, the Holocaust uh, on various areas there, and he started out uh, with uh, work on uh, the German army, the Wehrmacht, uh, and the crimes they committed during the war, uh, during the Second World War. Later on, he talked about, uh, or his studies were on the link between war and genocide in general, 
and uh, most recently he focused uh, on the inter-ethnic relationships uh, in, the, in certain regions in Eastern Europe. He published uh, a huge variety of books, um, one, some of them like uh, Murders in Our Midst, The Holocaust, Industrial Killing and Representation, won the uh, Frankel Prize um, from the uh, uh, Institute for Contemporary uh, History and Wiener Library in London. Um, uh, very well uh, received book was Mirrors of Destruction, War, Genocide, and Modern Identity. But he also wrote about uh, the Jew in cinema, about anti-Semitic stereotypes, and published a book uh, from the Golem to Don't Touch My Holocaust uh, in 2005. He edited several important volumes. One of those is uh, kind of published in several uh, editions which is called The Holocaust, Origins, Implementations, and Aftermath, where he kind of uh, brought together scholarship, uh, important scholarship on the uh, Holocaust and kind of updates this uh, on a, a frequent basis, which I think is uh, a very uh, important quality because often uh, people, when they uh, advance in their careers, they're kind of standing at a certain point in time and they stay there. But he is not like this. He is really immersed and interested in new scholarship. He also uh, edits, uh, co-edits uh, a series on uh, war and genocide at Berkhan uh, books. So uh, his uh, kind of uh, achievements are like vast. And I have to stop now. I want to just at the end mention <laughs> that uh, with his focus on the uh, borderlands and the Eastern European areas, he um, published recently an important volume which is called Erased, Vanishing Traces of Jewish Galicia in Present-day Ukraine, which focuses on the memory of the Holocaust. But his current research, which he is now almost uh, about to publish, I have to say, is this correct? Uh, is uh, about a small town in Ukraine uh, called Buchaj. And he will talk uh, about this more in his lecture and explain why he focuses on this uh, small town, why this is important, and what can we actually uh, take, uh, take from there. Um, and this is uh, kind of the ground for his book, which was called uh, The Voice of Your Brother's Blood, Bucharch Biography of the Town, which is about to be published. Thank you, and uh, give him a warm hand. <laughs> Thank you very much uh, for attending this uh, lovely lunch. Um, I, I will try not to keep you too long away from eating, uh, but I will talk for about uh, 40 minutes uh, about issues that relate to uh, this recent study. Um, the um, book that is about to be published uh, has now uh, been renamed. Uh, Yes? Closer to the mic. Oh, is this better? Okay. Yes. Um, and as, as you can see, uh, the book is now titled Anatomy of a Genocide, uh, The Life and Death of a Town Called Buchach. Uh, and I just recently received the galley of the cover. Um, but it is important to remember the original title that I had in mind, and I want to say something about where that comes from. Uh, some of you may remember uh, these lines from reading Genesis. Uh, and God said to Cain, where is Abel, your brother? And he said, I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? And he said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. In many ways, uh, this book, uh, on which I've been working now for a very long time, uh, is an attempt to uh, understand uh, the voices of the people who had once lived in that area uh, and who have been largely forgotten, both in that area and outside of it. I began. Uh, in many ways in 1995, so that's a pretty long time ago, uh, when I was interviewing my mother. Uh, my mother was born in that little town, Buchach, uh, in 1924, uh, and she left in 1935 together with her parents and her two brothers. 
and went to Palestine. And for all the intervening years, I was born in the mid-1950s, until 1995, I never actually asked her much about her childhood. Uh, I grew up in Israel. People in Israel were not supposed to ask questions about the world that uh, their parents or grandparents had come from. We were a new generation. We were sabers. We were looking forward. We were not supposed to look back. Uh, but something happened in the 1990s that made me start thinking uh, about uh, where all these people came from and what was it that occurred there. And so it, that summer I was uh, visiting Israel. I'd, I'd uh, already left a few years earlier. I was there with my baby daughter and my toddler son. And my mother was making chicken soup. And I said... Uh, Ima, can you tell me about your childhood? And fortunately, someone told me that if you want to ask this question, you should produce a tape recorder, which I did. At the time, we didn't have iPhones, so I used a, a regular old tape recorder. And I pressed the button, and she spoke for about an hour and a half nonstop and talked about her childhood. It was the only time that I heard that story and I would not hear it again because three years later she passed away. Um, and it gave me a certain understanding of the kind of life that she had led in that little town uh, in the 1920s and the first part of the 1930s. It was not a story of uh, violence, of uh, fear. Uh, it was a very good story about uh, growing up in a warm home, having Polish and Ukrainian friends. She studied in school in Polish. She spoke Ukrainian with kids on the street. She didn't learn Hebrew because the Hebrew school cost money and the Polish school was public. It was free. So her father sent her to the public school, as many people did. Uh, it, it was a good childhood story about a world that I knew very little about. Now, why was I actually doing this? Why did I decide to uh, talk with my mother about that? Uh, this is um, my mother in Buchach, the little girl in the late 1920s with her mother and an aunt. Uh, the aunt didn't come out, but uh, her, her mother obviously did. Why was I asking this, this question? So you may remember that in 1989 uh, communism came to an end and we were told uh, by various people, such as Fukuyama, that that was the end of history, that now capitalism had won, there would never be any more wars, and we'd live happily ever after. And shortly thereafter, uh, there were two genocides. Uh, one in Bosnia that began in 1992 and continued for several years, for three years, with at least 250,000 people who were killed, in, often in, in horrible ways, in Europe itself. And the other happened in Rwanda in 1994, uh, the fastest genocide, the fastest recorded genocide in history. 800,000 people killed in 10 weeks, uh, mostly with machetes and fire, uh, often burnt in, in, in their own churches. Um, and so that was a context that um, started resonating with me because, um, as you heard, I've been studying the Holocaust for a long time, uh, one subtitle of one of the books I wrote was called Industrial Killing. And we had developed a certain idea of the Holocaust as an event of industrial killing. That is, an event in which the murderers had done their best to distance themselves from the victims so as to make it easier to kill them. And the Germans did make great efforts to do that, and that was the source, the cause, for the creation of the extermination camps, which is probably the most uh, particular unique feature of the Holocaust. Uh, so that people could be, for instance, um, led from their homes in a nice neighborhood in Berlin, in, in Grunewald, and taken to the train station. Their neighbors might be watching uh, through closed windows, uh, they would be loaded on a train, and they'd go east. And what happened in the east, nobody knew or wanted to know or wanted to hear about it. And when those people came to the east, those who met them didn't know who they were. And if, as the system became more and more efficient, they would often be immediately taken to 
an extermination camp. They would be undressed, they would be led into gas chambers, and within 20 minutes, 45 minutes, they would all be dead and would be cremated. So there was very little contact, first between the people who knew you where you lived and the people who were killing you, and secondly, the actual killers themselves often were very distant. Uh, there's a famous account um, um, written by Gita Sereni uh, called Into That Darkness. Uh, she had interviewed Franz Stangl, uh, who was the commandant of Sobibor and Treblinka. In Sobibor and Treblinka, uh, about uh, a million and a half people were gassed. Uh, and he talks about uh, how he would ride his white horse at a, some distance from the camp and he would see the Jews running to the um, gas chambers. And he says to her, I thought of them as lemmings, as these creatures that uh, commit su collective suicide every once in a while in their life cycle. And so I had gradually um, internalized this notion of how the Germans had created a system of industrial killing, which had roots also in uh, World War I that I won't go uh, into, of, of, of industrial warfare, of killing large numbers of people uh, in, in a mechanical fashion. Although in World War I, they were soldiers. In World War II, it, it, it then moves over to civilians, to women, to children, to the elderly. Uh, but I was never entirely happy with that explanation, uh, partly because of what we were seeing in the 1990s that we, we were seeing large numbers of people being killed largely by their neighbors in horrible, gratuitous, um, horrifying ways. But also because ultimately when you look at the figures you realize that only half of the victims of the Holocaust, only, it's very large numbers of course, but about half of the victims of the Holocaust were killed in extermination camps. What happened to the other half? Well, many of the others were killed where they lived. They were killed in their homes, they were killed in the streets, they were killed in the parks, they were killed in the cemeteries, and they're buried there. And in fact, they're still there in mass graves in those towns and villages uh, throughout Eastern Europe, which is where most of the Jews had lived. Now, we had a thought that it was important to dehumanize victims in order to be able to kill them, to think of them as not human. And that, of course, is partly true. And Jews were presented in anti-Semitic uh, rhetoric uh, as subhuman, non-human, a, a different race, and so forth. Uh, if you look at the rhetoric that was created, say, before the genocide in Rwanda, the Tutsi were, were talked about uh, as cockroaches. Uh, so when we see something like that, when we see that a certain group in a population is beginning to be uh, called not human, different from us, that's, that's a good sign that there may be a, a genocidal momentum here. So that is true. But on the other hand, in all those towns, in those small towns, something else was happening. That was communal genocide. That was people who knew each other well, who went to school together, who worked together, uh, who shopped together, who prayed in different prayer houses, but right next to each other. And so this question of what motivates people, what is it if it's not dehumanization, uh, began to trouble me increasingly. And it was then that I thought that um, one way to try and understand what is the dynamic of what happens in this kind of communal genocide that happened in hundreds of towns, villages, uh, is to look at one case and to see what happens in this one case. What happens in genocide in a little town? So I had to choose a town. And obviously it had to be in Eastern Europe because in Eastern Europe is where most of the Jews live uh, and where this dynamic developed. And I thought, well, I might as well choose the town that my mom came from. Why not? I know nothing about that town, which is why I actually interviewed her. So I was doing it both as a son and as a scholar. There was another reason that I chose that town, Buchach, uh, and that reason is Shmuel Yosef Agnon. Uh, so when you say Buchach in the United States or in most places in the world, most people say, what's that? I mean, how do you pronounce that thing? 
uh, especially if you spell it in the Polish spelling. It doesn't. It, it looks quite strange. Uh, C Z A C Z looks very strange. Uh, why is this jumping around? Um, um, but in Israel, most people know about Buchach. They don't know much about the city, about the town, but they know the name because Shmuel Yosef Agnon, Shai Agnon, uh, is a very well-known author in Israel. And in fact, he is the only um, author uh, who received the Nobel uh, Prize in Literature for literature written in Hebrew, uh, which he received in 1966. Um, Agnon left Buchach very early, uh, when he was 21 in 1908. But much of his writing was about his town, which came uh, to represent for him the entire universe of East European uh, Jewry, of what he called Podolia, Galicia, um, the, the small towns uh, that were scattered all over Eastern Europe where Jews were a very large part of the population at some point in many of those towns, especially in the late 19th century, there were about half of the population. Um, and so I also knew something about that, but Agnon, of course, uh, wrote about Buchach as a Jewish town. Uh, he hardly, he mentions a few Gentiles here and there, but by and large he's only interested in it as a Jewish town. And the uh, popular imagination in Israel uh, and elsewhere is that there were these shtetls in Eastern Europe. The shtetls were, shtetlach were uh, Jewish towns, and now they don't exist anymore because the Jews were mostly murdered if they hadn't left before. But of course, this is only a figment of uh, the Jewish collective imagination. There were no towns, there were only Jewish. All those towns had other people living in them. Uh, who were these other people, and what was the relationship between those other people, and what happened there uh, during the Holocaust was something that I started thinking about at that time. And so as I started studying what happened in Buchach uh, during World War II, I realized that the point was not only the moment of contact between the perpetrators and the victims which was my original question, the one thing that I really wanted to know. W did they know each other? How is it that people come from the outside, get to know the people who live in a place, and then kill them? It turned out that it was much more complicated because there were not only victims and perpetrators. There were people that we tend to call, I would say wrongly, as I'll say in a moment, bystanders. That is, there were all these neighbors. What was the relationship between the victims and the bystanders? And so as I started uh, studying this, um, um, I started understanding that if you want to um, um, comprehend the dynamic of a local genocide, you have to first of all understand the relations between the people in that community before the violence begins. There's a famous book that came out a few years ago by a Polish-American historian, uh, Jan Tomasz Gross, called Neighbors, in which he describes, uh, analyzes uh, a, a specific event in an East Polish town called Jedwabne, in which uh, one day, uh, in uh, August 1941, uh, the Polish population of that town killed the Jewish population. Um, and it's, a, it's an important book, and it had um, uh, a, a great deal of impact on the politics of memory in Poland and the coming to terms uh, in Polish society. But the book, the way I started thinking about it, begins at the end. That is, it begins at the moment that the Poles decide to kill the Jews. But why does that happen? How do we understand that relationship? And this was what began to exercise me. Up tell you in, in, in a bit how I try to uh, go about that. Uh, but I want to go through a few points that um, 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 came up as I was studying this place. So first of all, as I said, when you study a local genocide, you realize that you have to understand the dynamic between perpetrators, between victims, and between bystanders. You also understand that there were various agendas at work. 
it wasn't only that there were people living in a town and then outside forces entered that town and started killing part of the population. Everyone had some sort of agenda. And there was a difference. Sometimes um, uh, interests coincided and sometimes did not between what people on the ground wanted to do and what people from the outside wanted to do. So, for instance, in this town, Bucharest, there were Poles, Ukrainians, and Jews. These Poles, Ukrainians, and Jews had lived there side by side, not always harmoniously, but most of the time without any violence, for about 500 years. 400 years if we sort of go by uh, what we can document. So from, from the 1500s. Over time, different groups started thinking about the others in ways that might have uh, produced violence at some point. Uh, but they had their own view of things. And when the Germans came in, they were not interested in any of that. They had only their own policy to implement. But as they came in, all these other motivations that existed in that town started um, operating under circumstances of war and occupation. And so what you see is a transformation over time from a community of coexistence, a community in which people had always lived together, and whether it was harmonious or not, they knew only that reality, they knew no other reality. They always were like that. They were divided into different niches, uh, um, socioeconomic niches, they had different religions, but they lived in the same place and they knew no other reality. A transformation of that community of coexistence to a community of genocide. How does that happen? It doesn't happen um, uh, uh, instantaneously. It is a process. Now another very important element for me was to understand this not only uh, through how historians looking from above, uh, writing the large histories, look at this, but from the inside. That is how people spoke about each other and about themselves over time. What was the voice of that town? What were the voices of the people uh, who were speaking, writing, creating narratives of themselves and of their neighbors? Uh, from as far back as we can find them. And again, what we find is that there were divergent narratives. Different groups were telling different stories about themselves, how they came there, who they're about, where they're going, and about their neighbors. And as you know, people often define themselves not only by who they are, but who the others are. Right? Uh, it's quite common. And so people had strong views about the other groups as well. These were not um, um, uh, views that led to conflict. Uh, much of the time, people told their stories about themselves and others uh, among themselves. And it didn't matter that another group was telling another story. Uh, once there was a moment of violence, then these stories could become conflictual stories. They could become antagonistic. They could lead to violence. But they didn't do so under the normal uh, uh, routine of things until the late part of the 19th century. And I'll get to that in a moment. I also had to think about the use of these kinds of documents, that is, people speaking about themselves in history. This is obviously part of uh, the Shoah Foundation. People have thought about this a great deal. The use of testimony. Uh, you you uh, may know that historians, uh, including myself, trained in an old empirical tradition, have um, always been uh, very skeptical of uh, individual voices. Uh, maybe not voices of great leaders, but voices of the little people. Uh, because they are subjective, because they tell their own story, because they often tell a story after things happened already, so they may not get the details right, because they may have different agendas, uh, in, in short, because they're subjective and unreliable. And there is, of course, an element of truth in that. Uh, one has to know that if somebody tells what, happens to, what happened to them 20, 30 years later, they may get all kinds of details wrong, uh, dates, names of places, and so forth. And by and large, uh, historians, especially of the Holocaust, uh, 
uh, were extremely suspicious uh, of the vast amount of testimonies that were being collected, uh, often by people who wanted these testimonies to serve as material for writing that history. And said, well, yes, these are very interesting stories. They tell us how these people felt, but they may not help us in reconstructing the event itself. And so for me, of course, this uh, was not, uh, increasingly, not a point of view that I could agree with. Uh, and the more I thought about it, the more I realized how much we miss in the reconstruction of an event, particularly an intimate event such as that in one location, if we don't listen to the voices of the people who live there. What they tell you is what official documents won't tell you. And at times they tell you something that you would not find anywhere else. They tell you about what they experienced. They tell you about what they thought of others. They tell you about what happened that those who wrote documents didn't care about and therefore didn't document. But of course one has to integrate that into the historical uh, narrative as well. Uh, so that the history of a place becomes a convergence of whatever documents you can find in the archives and the stories that people tell. And so, in a sense, what I was trying to do was to recover the experience and the reality of genocide in a locality uh, from all the documents that I could find, which is one reason that it took me such a long time to write this book, because initially I thought, how much is there to write about one little town in Eastern Europe, the population of which was at its height 15,000 people? Uh, it took me well over a decade. Uh, I went to archives in, in eight countries, nine countries, uh, in nine languages, uh, in over 50 different archives. Uh, and I have a room that itself now looks like an archive uh, filled with documents. Uh, so you can find a great deal if you want to, if you have the crazy idea of writing an absolute history of a place, of everything that everybody said about it. Um, but in a sense, what I wanted to do was a thick description of that town over time. So let me uh, give you some of the points that emerge from that. First of all, when you look at how people speak about a place when violence begins, or even when they talk about the origins of that violence, you may not be surprised to find that everyone describes themselves as victims. This is important to understand because this is not only in the sense that uh, some people are real victims and some are just saying they're victims to cover up uh, the crimes that they committed, but that people in a real sense feel that at one point or another they were actually victims. But more than that, they don't only think that they're victims, they often think that they're victims of their neighbors, of those who live next to them, those they know, those they have intimate knowledge of. Their girls went to school together. Uh, they worked in the same office. They studied in the same school. They shopped together in the market. And yet at some point, they believe that they're victims of their neighbors, and in a sense, that their neighbor's success is their failure. That if the neighbor, the, the Polish neighbor, the Ukrainian neighbor, the Jewish neighbor does well, that is their, to their detriment. You also find that perceptions, and I'll say a little bit more in a moment, of such um, concepts that to us seem quite uh, simple, such as collaboration, betrayal, heroism and liberation, just to name a few, differ uh, dramatically from one group to another and from one point to another. For instance, in 1944, the town of Buchash is liberated. It's actually liberated twice, but we'll get to that in a moment. It's liberated by the Red Army. Or at least that's what the Jews say, that it is liberated, because the few, very few Jews who survive there see that as liberation. But the Ukrainian population does not see that at all as liberation. It's a reoccupation by the Soviets. 
who had already been there in 39 to 41. And they fight against this reoccupation. And they're deported in large numbers because of that. And many of them are killed. For them, it's not a liberation at all. If there is any liberation, it comes in 1991, uh, when Ukraine becomes independent. Um, I'll get to other um, issues of uh, uh, different perceptions of these terms. And finally, I'd say that the, in, in, in the, these three paradigms, that the larger view that we have um, of what happens in, in these areas uh, that one historian has uh, referred to as the bloodlands, um, that is of a titanic struggle between two great powers, the Soviet Union and Nazi Germany, uh, which invaded this area and victimized its uh, uh, population, mm -hmm. its civilians, uh, looks completely mm -hmm. different when you look at it from the inside. That much of the violence and much of the understanding of the violence and the understanding of reality there is not only about the fact that either the Soviets or the Germans come. It is that the Ukrainians want a free Ukraine. It's that the Poles want to keep the land that they see as their historical heritage. It is a, a completely different type of struggle, much of which is really a civil war that is happening at the same time as these two powers are fighting each other. And that most people think about it that way at the time. Okay, so that's, uh, uh, I have another 15 minutes or so. So um, uh, I want to take you on a little trip through the book so you get some idea of uh, how I go about doing that. Um, I'll just say two more words about what I think uh, the larger benefits of um, writing such a study uh, and what I've learned from it and hopefully uh, it will be useful to others. The first is that I think a book like this, a case study like this, which obviously uh, can be uh, magnified uh, to many hundreds and hundreds of towns throughout this vast swath of territory that used to be uh, uh, an area of uh, mixed ethnicities from the Baltic to the Black Sea running from Estonia, Lithuania, Belarus, Poland, Ukraine, Romania, Hungary, all the way down to the Black Sea. This whole area that had a mix of population was filled with towns like Buczaj. That The benefit of studying one such town closely is that it really tells you something that we usually don't think of when we talk about the Holocaust. It gives a very different understanding of the Holocaust as an intimate affair of both external murderous powers and intimate gratuitous violence within the communities themselves. That is of communal massacres and genocides. Uh, it is there uh, that uh, such other terms, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, immediately uh, become suspect. Uh, one term that I mentioned earlier is bystanders. So as I said, so we have a view, okay, there were murderers, there were victims, and there were neighbors who were looking through their windows. But if you think about a small town in which genocide happens on a regular basis, that, that is regular massacres over an extended period of time, it does not look like bystanders. Um, so as an example, uh, if you uh, live in a four-story house, uh, your neighbors on the fourth floor are a Jewish family, you are, let's say, a Ukrainian family, and one day uh, the Ukrainian police, the Jewish police, and the uh, German police and the Gestapo come and take the Jewish family. Uh, if the Jewish family resists, then they shoot them right there on the street. So you can actually see them being shot on the street. This is not what happened in Germany, but this happened all over the place in these towns. If they cooperate, then they're taken nearby to either the cemetery or another hill nearby, both of which are within uh, 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 seeing distance from where you live, and they're shot together with many hundreds of other people. You can hear the shots. So now you know that they're dead. Now, th they were your neighbors. You were in good relations with them. You, your children studied in the same school together. They helped each other do math in the kitchen. But now they're gone. 
Now, the apartment in the fourth floor is better than the one on the first floor because you get better air, circulation, it's a bit larger maybe. They also have some nice uh, feather blankets. They may have some pots and pans that you've always thought it would be nice if you had. So what do you do? Uh, if you don't move in, then the neighbors from the third floor might move in. So you move in. Um, or somebody knocks on your door at night, uh, a woman you know with a baby, and she says, please hide me because they're running after me. There's an actia, there's an action, there's a roundup. Uh, now, you also have children at home. Do you let them in? Do you not let them in? If you let them in, how long will you keep them? If they pay you money to buy food, what happens when they run out of the money? What happens if your neighbors start suspecting that you're hiding Jews uh, someplace in, in your cellar if you're in a village? Uh, and they think that you're making money off of the Jews that you're hiding, which was very common in the villages. Uh, do you then hand them over? Because if you don't hand them over, then your neighbors are going to denounce you, and then the police might come and kill you and your children as well. All these notions of collaboration, who is collaborating, who is um, uh, a bystander, who is rescuing, become extremely complicated when you look at the simple social reality of one place. If you think about resistance, we like, I, I grew up in a country where of course when I was growing up uh, we only talked about resistance. Uh, most of the Jews went like sheep to the slaughter but then there was the Warsaw Ghetto Rebellion and uh, we commemorated that and as you know uh, Holocaust Day in Israel is called Yom HaShoah V'Agvurah the day of the Holocaust and of heroism. So the two terms are united. And heroism meant, of course, the meaning of heroism can change over time, but at the time, it meant armed resistance. That's what the way we understood it. Um, but if you look at a town like this, and I'll give you just one example, uh, there was, uh, I, I interviewed uh, someone. Uh, I had given a lecture at Haifa University in um, 2000 or 2002, and somebody came up to me and said, you know, my father comes from Buchach. Uh, would you like to interview him? I said, yeah, of course. And it turned out that uh, this woman's father lived uh, one street away from the street on which I grew up as a kid in Ramat Aviv. So I thought, well, that's cute. So I went there and I sat with him for two hours and interviewed him and uh, his wife served cookies. And he was this wonderful, short, sturdy guy with an iron handshake. And he told me about his childhood growing up in Buchach and his Ukrainian friends and Jewish friends. And, uh, and then he spoke about being in the forest and being in the resistance. And he said, you know, you, one shouldn't exaggerate. The Wehrmacht was not scared of us. We, we weren't any danger to the German army. Uh, we were basically trying to protect ourselves and we were trying to dissuade uh, Ukrainians from denouncing Jews who were in hiding. So they tried to kill a number of well-known denouncers so as to stop this mass phenomenon of denunciations that then people would be recompensed, recompensed for by the Germans. So it was a very good story and I obviously believed every word. Uh, and a few years later I was working uh, with German documents of trials, of post-war trials, and there was um, a trial in 1968 of a German policeman who uh, was in that town. He was a particularly nasty guy. Uh, and this same individual, Itzhak Bauer, uh, whom I had interviewed a few years earlier, gave testimony there about the German gendarme, about Peter Paul. And they asked him, how did you know this gendarme? And he says, well, because I was in the Jewish police. And suddenly I thought, well, that's strange. I, I thought he was in the resistance. Uh, well, it turned out that he was in both. Of course, he was in the Jewish police. He was a young man. He wanted to survive. He wanted to protect his parents. And after his parents were murdered, uh, his brother was still alive, and they knew that the Germans would turn next against the Jewish police. Then they went to the forest and became resistors. Only, of course, he, he, he never told me that. And so you, you suddenly understand that this... Uh, notion that there were the bad guys who were the policemen and they had a very bad reputation in the, the Ordnungsdienst in uh, Buchach as they did in many other towns and the guys who were in the resistance who were heroic uh, were quite often the same people at different times 
uh, always with a good motivation. Uh, and it's certainly not our place to blame them. But those who lived there during the roundups, when the Jewish policemen would crawl into the basements and pull out a people hiding and hand them over to the Ukrainians, they obviously could not forgive them for that. So that's the a second, I would say, and to me, an important element in doing such a study. Secondly, uh, I think that, that it, it compels us to think that, um, um, that the very concept of the Holocaust, as, as, as we've thought about it uh, until now, which is both from the top, so who gave the order and how was it organized, very much in the way the German scholarship had done it for a long time, which is a very important way to analyze uh, genocide. And also from the West, because most of the historians writing about the Holocaust uh, were trained in Western languages, not in Eastern languages, and thought of it much more as an event, as I described, of putting people on transport from France or, or the Netherlands and so forth, uh, has to change. And it has to change because so much of the Holocaust happens uh, on the local, on, in Eastern Europe, on the local level, in the towns themselves. And thirdly, that it helps us very much understand there's this big debate, as you may know, uh, is the Holocaust unique or not? Can it be uh, compared to other genocides? To me, this argument always seemed very strange because the Holocaust is an event that happened in history. Uh, all events that happen in history um, can be understood only by comparison. We cannot think of anything without comparing it to something else. Uh, but of course, each historical event has similarities and unique points. And the Holocaust, as I said, what was and remains until today, uh, thank God, uh, um, unique, is the creation of extermination camps. Uh, we don't know of uh, um, uh, such systematic uh, creation of extermination camps. But much of what happens in the Holocaust, as I said at the beginning of this talk, uh, was quite similar to what we see in other genocide. It was communal killing. It was happening on the ground between neighbors, uh, with a great deal of gratuitous violence, which I believe was very much part of the intimacy. The need of people to um, uh, use excessive violence precisely because they were exercising it against people they knew. Um, so it's, a, it's um, it, um, not dehumanization, uh, as we thought originally, but rather the need to make this person, as you're killing them, different from you. And so now in the last, uh, how much have I got left? Uh, a few minutes. Uh, great. So I'll take you now on a, a little journey, uh, because you don't know much about uh, where this place is. Uh, so as I said, Buchach was... Uh, uh, we know about Bucha since 1260. Uh, there's a document from 1260. It was then a, a feudal state. And it was, as you can see, in the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, uh, which people forget, but was the largest political entity in Europe uh, at, at that time. Uh, this is from the 16th century. Uh, it even grew a bit more afterwards. Uh, um, and, and so uh, Bucha was on the southeastern rim of that uh, entity uh, and was built originally as uh, one of a series of castles that were supposed to protect uh, Poland proper from invasions from the east and from the south. So from uh, Tatars from the east and from the Ottoman Empire from the south. Uh, and in, at around that time, uh, Jews uh, moving in large numbers, first from Ashkenaz, from Germany. Uh, this is what the word the Ashkenazi comes from, right? They're moving from Germany to Poland, and then from the heartland of Poland to the eastern uh, borderlands of Poland. And they're being invited by Polish noblemen to start commerce and urban life in those areas that are largely uh, peasant uh, territories. Uh, and so we have documents and tombstones of Jews in Buchach from the middle of the 1500s on. Uh, now, in uh, 1772, uh, 
the, the Habsburg Empire, the Austrian Empire, annexes um, southeastern Poland uh, and names it Galicia, invents the name Galicia, which is taken from uh, mid the medieval uh, principality, Halic, that had existed there in the 11th century. Uh, and that area, um, now Galicia, uh, becomes the, the easternmost and the poorest uh, part of the Austrian Empire. And Buczoc, as you can see, is located there now in Galicia. And many people speak, who, who came from there, spoke of themselves as Galiciana, right? So that's because they came from Galicia. Uh, and it has a very large Jewish population. It also has uh, a large Ruthenian population. They're later called um, uh, Ukrainians. Uh, they adopt the name Ukrainians and a large Polish population. And this is Galicia itself. And I, I just marked out so that you have some bearings. Uh, so Buczac is in the eastern part of eastern Galicia. Next to it is an important town called Chotkov. It's important for two reasons, really. One is that it's an, it was a very important Hasidic center. And the second is that in World War II, this is where the, uh, the German security police outpost is located. Uh, and that out outpost that I'll talk about in a moment uh, is responsible for the mass killings in that area. Uh, you can see Lemberg, or Lvov, Lvov, Lviv. It's all the same town, uh, which is the capital of Eastern Galicia. Not far from it is Berzets. Berzets, which is just across the border in Poland today, uh, is where half of the Jews of Galicia were gassed. It was the designated extermination camp uh, for Galicia. Uh, but some ended up in Auschwitz. And you can see that Auschwitz, too, is in the western part of Western Galicia. So this is really this uh, entire area. And the line on the right uh, that is east of Chotkov, this is the old border between <coughs> Russia and the Austrian Empire, later uh, the border with the Soviet Union. Okay, that just gives you a little bit of the locations. Now, in the book, I, I try to tell this story from the very beginning, and I trace the history of Buczac uh, uh, from the Middle Ages with a particular interest in the 17th century. I have to admit that a lot of this was taken out because the book was too long. Uh, but the 17th century is really important for this period because this is the time, uh, some of you may have heard of uh, Bogdan Khmelnytsky. And Khmelnytsky uh, was the Cossack leader uh, who rose up in 1648 against uh, Polish rule. Uh, and in that vast uprising that changed the entire structure of uh, Eastern Europe, uh, also slaughtered large numbers of Jews and the Jewish accounts of that period. And so for Jews living in that area, whenever there was a pogrom, later on people said Khmelnytsky. He was um, sort of associated with any violence against Jews. In uh, Ukrainian history, Khmelnytsky is a national hero. Uh, there is a, a, a five rivna note uh, in Polish currency, in Ukrainian currency, with his likeness. Uh, and he is considered to be the, 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 the early beginner of Ukrainian independence. Um, and so this is not only a story of history, but also of how, again, different groups think about that differently. The Poles believed that they were bringing civilization to the barbarous East. There's a famous uh, novel, uh, By Fire and Sword, by Henrik uh, Sienkiewicz. Um, I, I, I guess most people haven't heard about him here, but I read about him in, uh, in my childhood in a Hebrew translation, uh, which is about these wars. Uh, and he presents, uh, he also won the Nobel Prize in Literature, by the way, uh, but in the 1860s. Uh, and he wrote about a Poland's civilizing mission. Uh, how Poland went to civilize the Wild East. Because he couldn't go to the Wild East, he actually traveled to America to see what the Wild West looks like. <laughs> and he gave them a model. Uh, it's, it's, it's a true story. Um, so the Poles saw themselves as civilizing the East. The Ukrainians saw themselves as being colonized and subjugated uh, by uh, Polish landlords. Uh, and by the Jewish lackeys. That, that was the, the, the long-standing 
uh, Ukrainian complaint. Uh, and the Jews saw themselves as those who developed towns and commerce. Uh, they never actually talked of themselves as um, belonging to the land. Uh, in, in many ways, they did always think of themselves as transitory. Uh, the uh, historical word and, uh, for Jews of that area was Pauline, that's Poland. Uh, and Pauline was interpreted, including by Agnon, as Pauline, we will spend the night here. Uh, we are on the way. And, and what is interesting is that um, 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 Agnon, in 1939, published a famous novel called A Guest for the Night. Uh, and his entire concept was that the Jews had only stayed over in Eastern Europe for 400 years, and then they moved on, those who remained moved on to uh, Eretz Israel, to the land of Israel. Uh, but the book proper starts in 1848, and the reason is that that is the time that nationalism begins. And nationalism is really the process in which Poles, Ukrainians, and later, somewhat, a bit later, Jews begin to think of themselves as national groups. And in this competition between national groups, uh, the main question is who belongs and who doesn't. Uh, is this my place or is this your place? And if it is mine, why are you here? Uh, what are you doing here? Uh, much of that tension is between Poles and Ukrainians uh, because the, the Poles say, we came to civilize you guys, and the Ukrainians say, no, you didn't. You are subjugating us, and we are the indigenous population. Uh, uh, among Jews, by the late 19th century, early 20th century, this kind of growing nationalism uh, makes for the creation of Jewish nationalism, which is largely Zionist. Uh, and although the Zionists are not that numerous, they're more numerous in Eastern Galicia, and after World War I, they become a major political force within those communities, including in Buchach. Um, um, so I, I, I won't go into all the details of that, but what you see in this picture uh, is a typical of that period. This is the main square in Buchach, uh, the photo was taken in 1907. This is an, an, an election rally. Uh, most of the people in this photograph are Jews. Uh, one of the people on the right with a white hat is Shai Agnon, who was then 17, uh, just, just before he went to Palestine. And the interesting thing about the elections of 1907, which were the, f the first real democratic elections only for men in the uh, Austrian Empire, is that... Um, uh, the, the Jewish parties um, created a coalition with the Ukrainian parties against the Poles. That is, that this is still a period in which, despite the fact that parties are already recognized largely by ethnic lines, there is space for cooperation between them, usually two against the third. Now, all of this changes in World War I, because uh, while there is a growing rhetoric of violence before World War I. This area had not seen violence since the beginning of the 18th century. Uh, and the, the uh, rhetoric of violence of the latter part uh, of the 19th century, early 20th century, is not translated into actual aggression on the streets. World War I is an extraordinarily destructive war in Eastern Europe. It is at least as uh, destructive as in the West although we know less about it. Most of us read about the Western Front, the all quiet and the trenches, uh, but it's extremely destructive. But what is most important about it is that it doesn't end in 1918 in this area. It continues until 1921. And right after the, Austria, the Austrian-Hungarian Empire uh, collapses, there's a war between Poles and Ukrainians over Galicia. Uh, the Ukrainians want to create a Western Ukrainian Republic, and the Poles wanted to be part of independent Poland. And most of the people fighting during the war itself are not really fighting for the empire. They're fighting for their own national cause. The Ukrainians for an independent Ukraine, the Poles for an independent Poland, and the only people who are Kaiser toy, who are loyal to the Kaiser, to the emperor, are the Jews, because they anticipate, many of them, what it would look like if the empire is gone. Uh, and so World War I is crucial because it's the first time that uh, a rhetoric of nationalism is translated into violence. Uh, then Poland is created, is resurrected, 
uh, the Poland that disappeared at the uh, end of the 18th century reappears, mm -hmm. and much of Eastern Poland uh, uh, has a minority of Poles. Much of it uh, has a majority of Ukrainians, or if you go further north, of Belarusians. That means that under uh, Polish rule, in the area of Buchach, in this whole region of Eastern Galicia, uh, what you find is that there is a growing Ukrainian nationalism suppressed brutally by uh, the Polish authorities, which leads to the creation of a violent underground, the organization of Ukrainian nationalists established in 1929, which uh, has many associations with different fascist groups, the, the Ustasha and the um, and Italian fascism and so forth. Um, and by the 1930s, there's uh, growing f official anti-Semitism also by the Polish state, uh, exercise against Jews, uh, and growing impoverishment of the Jewish population in that area because there's lack of jobs and any economic opportunities. Um, this is from a uh, girls' school in Buchach in the 1930s, and many of the girls here are known the names are known. Most of them didn't survive. Uh, now, as, um, another crucial point is what happens in 1939. In 1939, this area is annexed by the Soviet Union. So all of uh, Eastern Poland, by agreement between Hitler and Stalin, uh, is annexed by the Soviet Union. Uh, under Soviet rule, uh, the Soviets uh, employ their own tactics of uh, repression and they deport very large numbers of people. They start by deporting Polish elites uh, and nationalists. Then they deport um, uh, um, Jewish Zionists and uh, industrialists and all, all people of some uh, um, uh, economic uh, wherewithal. Uh, and finally, just before the German invasion, they uh, incarcerate and kill large numbers of Ukrainian nationalists. Um, and that is the point at which the Germans march in. Um, so that means that when the Germans march in, in uh, late June, early July 1941, uh, there is massive violence in that area. The elites have been decapitated. Uh, the Soviets had uh, antagonized the three ethnic groups one against the other. And all the previous uh, nationalist rhetoric now returns with a vengeance. The Germans themselves then establish their own system. And the system, um, and here I'm talking really just about the uh, system of rule in that area, is based on having a small German force in that nearby town of Chotkov. We are talking about 20 to 30 Germans. Not all of them are German. Some are ethnic German, they're Poles. Or, um, and those 30 Germans are responsible for the murder of 60,000 Jews in that area alone. Now obviously they can't do that alone, and so how do they do that? They um, take the Ukrainian militias that uh, arise right as the um, uh, Soviets retreat and transform them into their own uh, auxiliary police. And so in that town there's also a battalion of about 350 Ukrainian policemen. They install small police forces in all the little towns. They install uh, Jewish councils in all the towns, including in Buchach, and they create, they have them create Jewish police forces. And so all that these few people uh, living in Chotkov have to do once they've established the system is every once in a while get into their jeeps and trucks and drive down to the town. They inform it beforehand by phone that they're coming. Uh, all their auxiliaries round up uh, the Jews they can find. They take them to the nearby hill. Uh, they are already pre-dug graves there, and they shoot them. And most of the shooting is done by the Germans. Everything else, the um, blocking the roads, rounding up the people, uh, is done mostly by uh, Ukrainian auxiliaries uh, and with assistance from the Jewish police. Um, in this chapter, I talk a great deal about the reality of genocide from the point of view of the Germans, because what one has to understand is that these few Germans who came there actually uh, had a fantastically good time there. They bring their families with them, they bring their children, they bring their parents. They live a really good life. It's a nice, quiet area. There's no fighting there, apart from their own killing. Um, they, um, 
uh, get all the best furniture they can, uh, all the best food, booze, uh, cigarettes, whatever they want. Uh, and um, every once in a while, they can exercise the uh, absolute authority by killing whoever they wish to kill. Uh, there's never any problem finding volunteers. According to all the testimonies, people were happy to volunteer to do the killing. Uh, and at the end of the war, uh, they go back home usually to their jobs. If they're policemen, they go back to the, the police. If they're uh, administrators, some run for political office and so forth. Uh, and trials start only about two decades later, and the vast majority of people are not tried. Those who are tried, the vast majority are acquitted, and the very few who are sentenced to life sentence never finish their sentence and spend their uh, often very long uh, years after prison uh, at home and dying bed uh, at home. Um, I also talk uh, a great deal about the Jewish experience of what happens in that town, and that is based on a mass of about 250 testimonies. And um, what interests me most in this chapter really is the extent to which, and that's really important to understand, the extent to which um, um, survival depended on relations between Jews and non-Jews. You could not survive if people didn't help you. Uh, so all of the survivors were helped by other people, uh, but there were very few survivors. And even those who were helped by other people speak a great deal about betrayal and denunciation. And so what you, uh, I won't go at length now because uh, you are going to miss your lunch, but what, they, uh, what is really important to understand is the extent to which that complex relationship that really interested me from the very beginning, you can see that in the daily struggle for survival, for, for survival of the Jews, that they depend entirely on the environment, on the population around them. And finally, in the, in the final chapter, I talk about the Ukrainians and the Poles, and that too is based on a large number of testimonies, Polish and Ukrainian and other documents. And what you find there is that although for Jews, uh, the relationship with uh, Gentiles was crucial, for Poles and Ukrainians, the major preoccupation was Poles and Ukrainians. Uh, they were mostly fighting each other uh, or trying to survive each other uh, because in the latter part of the German occupation, as of 1943, the Ukrainian underground begins a vast uh, ethnic cleansing operation uh, with the goal of creating a Jew-free, which has already been assured by the Germans, and a Pole-free, which is, doesn't interest the Germans at all, a Pole-free Ukraine. And so they are cleansing villages one after another. The Poles try to resist there, and, 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 and the Poles have support from central Poland, from the home army. And so there's a civil war that is happening right at that time, uh, and which is entirely separate from either the killing of the Jews or from German policies, uh, but that creates a legacy of, um, a, of violence uh, in that area uh, that in many ways is uh, there until today. I'll just show you that Buchach now is in Western Ukraine. So that's the location now. And if you go there today, then this is what's left of the Jewish cemetery. Uh, th this cemetery and the hill that's behind it in the background were the two sites of mass killing. The town is right in the middle. Uh, both are within a 10, 15 minute walk from the center of town. Uh, all together, there are about um, five to 7,000 people buried in mass graves there, uh, which are unmarked. Thank you very much. Taking some questions? Oh, sure. I mean, yeah. Happy so, to. If, if there are very few questions. If there are any questions, I would love to, yeah. Yeah, how do the, uh, the people who live there today feel about Jews? I, I think, given the mic, so. How do the uh, people who live in Chach today, uh, both Ukrainian or um, Poles, mm -hmm. feel about Jews today? 
so first, I mean, there, there are no Poles there either, or very, very few, because they, they were not only ethnically cleansed, but later on the Soviet authorities uh, did a population exchange. So they moved all the Poles who were there to Poland, what became Poland, and they uh, moved Ukrainians living in Poland into Ukraine. Um, um, well, usually the people there don't think about Jews at all, uh, not in these little towns because there are no Jews there. Uh, they do meet Jews because people come, especially Israeli tourists in uh, nice buses, and uh, to see Jewish sites. Uh, it doesn't create for a very good, uh, make for a very good relationship because they look like uh, wealthy people coming in air-conditioned buses and pointing at former Jewish sites and looking at the population as primitives. And the population, there is some suspicion that somebody might want to have their property back because so much of the property uh, in the center of town had been taken from Jews. The Jews lived in the center. Um, so no, not a good relationship. But you have to go to the biggest cities to see attempts to rework this history. So in Lviv, there, there are attempts in some places to recall that past, but not in the small towns. There was a question. Turn it on. I have one question. My father was born in Bukhara too, but he talked about Barish. So what was Barish? Oh. Barish is, uh, is another town which is um, about 30 miles from Buchach. There was a, a large uh, community there too, a large Jewish community there too. And it was under the control of the same uh, Zisha Heights Polizei, the same security police. I don't know. Okay. Uh, the comments I want to make, number one, uh, the saved during World War II by a Catholic family. And I once asked the woman why she did it, and her answer was what the Nazis were doing was wrong. Mm -hmm. And that was it. And I thought that was extremely moral. I mean, it was because she put her whole family in. Right. Okay, the other comment I wanted to make was that during World War II, after we crossed the Rhine River, there was very little uh, contact with the army. They had what they called the Volkswagen side, but that was nothing. But as we drove along, there were people standing by the side of the road, and this was uh, early March, so it was cold and wet and everything else. And people were waving flags, so we really couldn't make it out what was going on until we had to slow down. And I asked one of the people, she was wa uh, waving an orange flag. It turns out, that the, when the Germans heard that the Americans were coming through, they took all of these slaves that they had on their farm or whatever, kicked them out of the houses, and let them just fend for themselves. So when we stopped, of course, we uh, made sure these people had clothing and uh, the Germans had lots of food. So it was a disease of the entire people. It wasn't just the Nazis or in the army. Mm -hmm. Did you come to any conclusions about when a bystander ceases to become a bystander and is clearly complicit? Or is there really such a thing as a bystander mm -hmm. when a crime is being committed? Since mm -hmm. This seems to be a big part yeah. of your right. So, um, I mean, my understanding of it 
now when you live in a community like that, and you can think of yourselves living in any community that you live in, uh, there, it's really a range. There's a range between people who will cooperate with whoever has power and try to profit from it, all the way to people who will be altruistic, like this uh, Roman Catholic woman, and just say, I will help, and I will give you my last potato, my last uh, loaf of bread, and uh, even if it endangers my own family. There's a range, and people operate within that range, but there is no indifference or no passivity. And these sort of terms that we use are simply not applicable because you're living in a living social organism. You see it all the time. You're living right in the middle. There were uh, German women in, in Butrach, for instance, who were wives of engineers who were working in reconstructing the tunnel there. They're Jewish maids who were educated women but now became their maids. And they were looking out of their windows and seeing people being shot on the street. And they were trying to create this uh, comfortable bourgeois existence for themselves and their husbands with little cocktail parties, little dinners, so I, I imagine that as a kind of bourgeois island floating on an ocean of blood. They all could see and tell. And so were they bystanders? Obviously they were not bystanders. They were, they were facilitators. Um, but it doesn't mean that everyone was doing the same thing. It simply means that there is no passivity. And that saying, I just stood by, nobody stood by. Everybody was involved. When you uh, talked at the beginning about a very short uh, genocide like Rwanda, where 800,000 died in 10 weeks, and you're talking about a very small town of 15,000, which maybe, what, five or 6,000 were Jews, how long of a period did it take to basically liquidate whatever, 5,000, mm -hmm. 3,000? Mm -hmm. Well, um, so there were about 8,000 Jews in Buchach, and 10,000 Jews were, were murdered. Uh, because they brought people from the outside as well. They collected them from the villages. And of those 10,000, about half, it's very hard to say exactly, but about half were killed in situ, and the other half were deported to Belgians. Uh, th all of this uh, happens uh, by large between uh, October 1942 and June 1943. So That's it. Sure. Yeah, but you have to understand the same when, when, when you talk about uh, the time. So there's the time of the genocide is, is short, right? But in between, there's very little violence. So in between the, the different actions, uh, the different raids, uh, people go back to normality. So the Germans come and raid, they come in October, they come in November, they come in February, they come in April, and they come in June. And each time they catch who they can catch and either put them on trains or kill them on the spot. In between, uh, people try to live. And the second thing that's important to understand is that both in Rwanda and in this case, if you try to trace it back, you realize there's a long history of uh, demonizing others, right? I mean, the conflict between the Tutsi and the Hutu in Rwanda doesn't start in 1994. It has a long history that goes back, and the same in Bucha. So that kind of social dynamic that is created, where, where groups are, at some point, can suddenly reach for each other's throats, needs a longer history. It doesn't happen just like that. I would say we take two more questions. Uh, a point on historical memory. Uh, one of my colleagues, Louise Steinman, has written a book about uh, her grandparents' village in Poland, mm -hmm. Radomsko, mm -hmm. and went back there. And they were interviewing, uh, she doesn't speak Polish, but she had mm -hmm. a translator, so they went into a bar one night just to talk to people. Mm -hmm. And they asked them, this was just a few years ago, so what happened to the Jews of your village? Mm -hmm. And their response was, well, they took their money and they left town. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so in the, you know, in the, especially in the smaller communities, you will often hear uh, such stories. Uh, some years before Gross wrote uh, the book on uh, Yedvabne, uh, an, an American journalist who is ethnic Polish uh, went there with his father, and he was interviewing uh, people there. That's before the book came out and that became known. 
uh, but in the place they always knew, and the Jews who came from there always knew uh, about the story. And uh, he asked the same question. He asked what happened to the Jews, and the local historian, a lot of these places have local historians, so the local historian said, well, the, the Germans came and killed them. So he said, well, but according to the Jews, it was the Poles who killed them. So he said, look, I mean, the Poles have their story, the Jews have their story, and we have ours. All the facts. <laughs> it's alternative. <laughs> Voila. <laughs> okay, I think we we'll take the last question because I think we are then, uh, moving on to the lunch. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, I'm going to ask a question that I'm going to ask you about. As you know, there's so much in the Holocaust about death of Jewish property. I'm curious how much do you think the motivation for this genocide in this town was motivated for economic uh, the, um, that's, that's a very simple and a very complicated question. Uh, it, it's simple in the sense that, that everyone was, was interested in property. Everybody was poor. And although most of the Jews there were also poor, they were a bit less poor than other poor people. And so, as I said, I mean, they were interested in pots and pans, in, in blankets, and of course in real estate. Um, I, I don't think that's what motivated it there. Uh, what, what motivates uh, the killing are two things. One is that uh, it's, it's possible, right? The Germans are there and they're doing it. Uh, they, are, they are the organizers. And so now you have a good opportunity to do that. That is very similar to what happened, I didn't talk about it, but the town was uh, uh, occupied by the Russians in World War I. And there were also pogroms there. And the peasants would come with their carts from the villages to collect property. Right? Now, they, they didn't start the violence. The violence was the Cossacks were killing Jews. But the peasants would come and collect what they could get because they were poor, and why let the you know, good uh, property just rot? We might as well make use of it. Uh, the larger question is, is a big one, and that is that so much of property in Eastern Europe uh, is stolen property. Uh, so many people live, not themselves often, I mean, they didn't steal it, but there is a deep memory of it having been taken away. And that is part of the response that you may get in all kind of towns that you come to. People suspect that you may have some document that will prove that the apartment they live in doesn't belong to them. And so that is a motivation for not talking about these events. That fear that for poor people, and people are still very poor in those parts, that somebody would come and take it away from them. Uh, okay. So I want just to thank Vicky uh, Shapiro for enabling us uh, to bring uh, Emma Bacchus here. Uh, and and I, I also think that you all understood why we brought him here, because that's a fascinating uh, view onto history and is really also uh, kind of part of a trend now to look into these micro-histories and that we can learn so much from them. So thank you, Omar, so much. Thank you, thank you.